And we are so thankful to be partnered with the International Mission Board and just the work that they're doing all over the world. And so uh, it's just a good reminder for us that um, the, the church is, is alive and active, and, and you guys are a faithful part of that. And so we're so grateful uh, just for, for all you do to, to serve the Lord in that way. And so uh, we just ask you to continue to pray over this, uh, over this month at how you can participate in, in our annual offering. And so beyond that, we're, we're very, Kyle already shared this, but we're so excited to be back together. Uh, we missed you guys. Um, it's good for us to be gathered uh, in worship this morning, both those of you that are able to be here on campus and those that are joining us online. Uh, and so we are, um, uh, as Kyle already mentioned, if you are, if it is your first Sunday with us, um, we're especially thankful that you chose uh, to visit with us. And so if that's you, we'd love to connect with you. You can stop by the uh, welcome desk for those that are here on campus. We have a gift for you. Um, and for those that are joining us online, you have a digital way to connect with us. And so uh, you can even let us know how we can be praying for you. So we would love for you to, to uh, take part in that. And so uh, and, and so I don't, I, I love this time of year. Like as you look around, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas, right? Um, sorry, I'm not, I'm not going to bust into song. Uh, but, <clears throat> but I love this time of year. I don't, I don't know about you. Maybe your living room looks like, you know, Hobby Lobby threw up uh, or, or your house, the, you know, the outside of your house would rival the Griswolds. You know, you're like, you're, you can now see your house from space, right? Um, you know, I don't know if that's what you get into or, or just baking. Maybe baking's your thing. Uh, you end up cooking things you would never cook any other time of the year. Um, and so for me personally, I just, I love the sights, the sounds, the smells of Christmas. Uh, and I love the cooler weather and all of it. Um, and so, so this is just such a special time. But for, for us as believers... Uh, for Christians, it is an even more profound time. Uh, it's a time for us to uh, remember and, and rejoice in the birth of our Savior uh, and to look forward to, to his coming uh, again. And that, uh, this, this whole month marks the beginning of the Advent season for the Christian calendar. And some of you, maybe you're familiar with the word Advent, or maybe that's kind of a new term for you. Uh, but that comes from a Latin word that means coming or arrival. Um, it actually has a double meaning. And, and so the, this Advent season marks the first Advent of Jesus and the birth of Christ. Um, and then it also marks the time of Christ's return that we are looking forward to. And so it's such a profound season for us because it's a time of, of looking back on God's faithfulness and the fulfillment of all his promises, but also uh, in a time of rejoicing and remembering that. But it's also a time of watching and waiting and looking ahead uh, to Christ's return. And so uh, it's just a good reminder. I don't know about you, but, but this has been a hard year, I know, for, for many of you. Um, and and it's, good, it's good for us to stop and remember God's faithfulness uh, and to remember the hope we have in Jesus and how that changes everything. And so, uh, so that's this uh, time of year for us, this season for us. And so we thought um, because of that, it'd just be very fitting for us to put a pause on our study through Romans. Uh, so for those of you that have been with us, we've been walking faithfully through the book of Romans. We're going to pause that and pick that up in the new year. Um, but we are beginning a brand new Advent series uh, today called Kingdom Come. And it is really the, the heart of that over the next several weeks, uh, starting this morning. We're going to look at the promise of Christmas, the plan of Christmas, the, the purpose of Christmas in the coming weeks. Uh, and then that'll lead up to, to our Christmas Eve service together that we're very excited about. And then on the other side of Christmas, we're going to look at our response to the, to the promise, the plan, and the purpose of Christmas. And so, so that's, our, uh, that's the design of this series this whole month. And so our hope is you'll be able to uh, join us all month long uh, as we look and celebrate both the, the coming of our Savior and His return. And so, uh, so that's kind of the heart of this morning. And, uh, and as we do that, um, uh, let, me just, let me just pray for us this morning before we dive in and study God's Word together. Let's pray. Father, we are so, so thankful that your word tells us that when we draw near to you, God, you draw near to us. That when we seek you with all our hearts, we find you. Uh, I'm just thankful for the opportunity to gather in your name, to worship you. We just pray this morning that you would open our eyes and open our hearts. Um, even though this is an especially uh, hard time for, for many of us, God, I just pray that we would hear clearly from you today. 
that, um, that through the power of your word, you would not only reveal your truth to us, but God, give us the courage to walk in it in what you reveal to us today. We just, we pray all this in, in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, with that in mind, we're, this morning, what we're going to do, we're going to look at the promise of Christmas. That's the heart of, of this morning. Uh, and to help us do that, we're going to look at two uh, key messianic prophecies in Isaiah chapter 7. And then we're going to look at their fulfillment in Matthew chapter 1. Uh, well, sorry, one in uh, Isaiah chapter 7 and Isaiah chapter 9, sorry. Uh, two different prophecies and then their fulfillment in Matthew chapter 1. Um, but, but before we jump into that, I want to talk a little bit very quickly, um, so just bear with me, but I want to talk for just a minute about the significance and the importance of prophecy throughout Scripture, throughout the, uh, especially uh, in the Old Testament. And the reason for that is because um, it's one of, throughout the Old Testament, it's one of the primary ways that God spoke to his people, that he would raise up prophets to reveal his truth. And, and what was, uh, made that even more profound, that, that it would be because um, God would reveal uh, things that no one else could know. Uh, and then, uh, then having them come true, the revealed prophecy would, would both give credibility to the prophet speaking on God's behalf, but also reveal God's faithfulness in keeping his promises. Uh, and so... Part of the reason we believe the Bible to be true, now there's many reasons, but part of the reason that we believe the Bible to be true is because of the significant amount, the number of prophecies given about Jesus that have all been fulfilled. Um, and and, uh, and so, there's, so there's, real, there's a lot of important, uh, important reasons to, to believe and to understand prophecy and the importance of prophecy. I just want to give you very quickly three as we jump into this this morning. Um, and the first is this, um, that prophecy reminds us that, that the Bible is one great unfolding story, not just a collection of stories, but it shows us that both the Old and the New Testament are part of, co of a cohesive story. It's not a bunch of separate stories. It's telling one great story, the story of God and the redemption of his people through Jesus, our Savior. That's the, that's the heart and the, and the testimony of all of Scripture. And prophecy shows us, the Old Testament prophecies that are given regarding Jesus and the fulfillment of those prophecies in the New Testament shows us that it's all one continuing story. Um, that that it's, uh, that's the heart of God, God's plan to rescue and redeem us through Jesus, our Savior. Uh, and so, so not only does prophecy give uh, the credibility, reliability to the Bible, but it gives us a greater insight. This is the second reason that prophecy is so important. It gives us greater insight into the work, the life, and the work of Christ. Um, that prophecy reveals more about why Jesus came, what he came to do, who he is, the character of God. Um, and so, so that's a second reason. And then lastly, um, and this is really the, the reason we're looking at, at this today, is it deepens our confidence in God's faithfulness. When we see the prophecies of God and then the fulfillment of those prophecies, it shows us that God is a promise keeper, that God is faithful to his word. That he can be trusted. Um, and so, so that's why I just wanted, before we jump into this, to just show a little bit of why this, I think this topic this morning is so important as we look at the promise of Christmas revealed in Isaiah 7 and 9 and then the fulfillment of that in Matthew. So, um, and if you're not, if you're not uh, familiar or amazed with the messianic prophecies in the Old Testament, you should be. Um, because I'm telling you, just preparing for this message I learned, I was, I was blown away, um, stuff that I thought I knew. And it's just amazing. Scholars' perspective on Old Testament messianic prophecies vary. I know that may surprise you, um, but that's because of the nature of prophecy. But, but they, they, uh, the range of messianic prophecies are between 300 and 400, okay? Just to, to clarify. And Jesus, what they do agree on is that Jesus fulfilled all of them. Now, stay seated, all right? Brace yourself, because I'm going to tell you a little bit more about this, because this is crazy, all right? So um, the odds of 300 prophecies being fulfilled in one person is so, it's so astronomical, it's humanly impossible. And that's why I'm thankful for the message of Christmas 
that what's impossible with man is possible with God, that nothing is impossible with God. Um, and by the way, these prophecies that are given in the Old Testament about Jesus, these aren't like rare, it's not it's like vague stuff. You know, one day there'll be a, a child who's born who will become a man and do some scary stuff and some people will like him, some people won't, and then he'll die. That's, it's not vague prophecies like that. For example, this is what scripture reveals to us. There's prophecies that talk specifically about where Jesus will be born, Bethlehem. We see, we read that in Micah chapter five, verse two, and that happened. Um, there's a uh, prophecy that he would be crucified by having his hands and feet pierced and that none of his bones would be broken in Psalm 22. And that happened. Um, then there's that he uh, would be crucified with criminals. That's in Isaiah chapter 53. And that happened. Um, that, the, that his executioners that killed him would gamble for his clothes, Psalm 22. And that happened. Um, that he would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver and that that silver would be used to purchase a potter's field. And that happened, Zechariah 11. That he would be uh, buried with the rich, Isaiah 53, and rise again, Psalm 16. And all of that happened. And there's, there's over 300 more. And so just to kind of show you, for those of you that have, if you have the version app and you're following along on that, I put, there's like 17 key prophecies in the Old Testament that were fulfilled, that we see the fulfillment of through Jesus that I put on there. But there's also a link, if you're curious and you want to know, there's a link to 351. And you can see the references and you can see where they're fulfilled all throughout scripture. Um, and so... So I just, I mean, this is, this is amazing stuff. Uh, and if that's not impressive enough, in 1958, I just want you to, to catch this. Because sometimes when you start throwing out numbers, it doesn't really, it doesn't really connect yet. So in 1958, uh, a renowned mathematics and astronomy professor named Dr. Peter Stoner, he did a statistical analysis on the probability of even eight, okay, just bear with me here, eight of the over 300 prophecies being fulfilled in one man. He did the statistical analysis of that. You know what he came up with? That the, re, the, the probability of eight of the messianic prophecies coming to be fulfilled, because these are hundreds of years before Jesus was born, right? And so the probability of eight of them coming true is one in 100 quadrillion. Okay, that's a one with 17 zeros, okay? So again, that's just eight of the prophecies. Now, I told you a minute ago, maybe you're a person like you hear numbers and you're like, blah, blah, blah. Maybe I'm sounding like Charlie Brown's teacher right now. Wah, 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 wah. You're like, I don't, what does that mean, right? And so uh, Lee Strobel, who wrote a book called Case for Christ. And if you wanna research some of this, I encourage you, that's one book you can read. Another is Evidence, New Evidence That Demands a Verdict by Josh McDowell. Those are great ways to research some of this. But Lee Strobel did some math of his own to take Peter Stoner's prediction, you know, that, that one in one quadrillion, to kind of put that in real life, like to give you a visual of what that would be like. And this is what he said. He said, imagine uh, the whole world, okay, being covered by one and one inch square tiles, one, one by one inch square tiles all over, everywhere there's land, all right, that all over the seven continents, right, and on the bottom of one of those, there'd be a red mark, okay, covered in, in tiles all over the earth, and, and a person be allowed to wander the earth for a lifetime. They can bend down one time, pick up one tile, the odds of them picking up the tile with a red dot under it is the probability of eight of the messianic prophecies being fulfilled in one man. That's, you're starting to get a visual here? Like crazy stuff, right? I mean, this is crazy. So, so uh, and then, and not, that's just eight. Jesus fulfilled them all. Okay, so we see just the, the power of God. And so, so this morning, I know I'm nerding out on you a little bit. And so if you're still saying, why do I need to know this? Why does this matter? I'm glad you asked. Because again, this teaches us that God is faithful. God keeps his promises. It teaches us what it looks like that as believers, we walk by faith and not by sight. Do you know how important that is, especially right now? For us as believers to understand the hope we have, 
that we walk by faith, not by sight, not by what we see, not by what's happening around, but by the faithfulness of our God. And that's the heart of, that's the promise. That is the promise of Christmas. That's the heart of this morning. The promise of Christmas changes how we live and how we see life. It changes everything. And so you need to understand just the heart of this. And so, and so let's look at two key prophecies in Isaiah 7 and Isaiah 9. And then we're going to look at their fulfillment uh, in, in, chapter, uh, in Matthew chapter 1. And so we're going to begin in Isaiah 7. Um, Isaiah 7, uh, verses 10 through 14, but I do need to give you a little background. I know you guys are like, wow, it's a lot of talking. I need to give you a little context for this before we jump in. And so um, here's what's happening in Isaiah chapter 7. Um, this takes place 700 years before Jesus is born. Okay, so 700 years before Israel, the Hebrew people have been divided into two kingdoms. Um, this came after the death of Solomon. And so there's a northern kingdom of Israel, and then there's a southern kingdom of Judah. So they've been divided into two kingdoms. And these kingdoms, going forward, they struggled to follow God. Uh, and, and eventually they both uh, were, went into exile. But at the time of this writing, at the time of what's happening, the context of Isaiah 7, there's a rising power in the Middle East known as the Assyrians, with an A, Assyrians, because there's also Syria. So just so you don't get those mixed up. But the Assyrians had risen to power and a lot of the neighboring nations, they're they kind of getting worried. They're getting nervous about these guys. And so Israel and Syria proposed an alliance. Okay, they wanted to come together to try to defend themselves against the Assyrians. And so they wanted King Ahaz, who was king of the southern kingdom, Judah, to join them. Okay, so Israel's the northern kingdom, they and Syria were coming together for an alliance, and they wanted um, the southern kingdom to join them. Well, Ahaz didn't want anything to do with it. He didn't like any of them, right? Um, but uh, they, he, so he rejected their offer. And so they decided they were just going to attack the southern kingdom. That they were going to, Israel and Syria were going to conquer them and just replace Ahaz with a king who would align with them. Okay, so that's the threat that's been given. So Ahaz and the people are freaking out. That's what you need to know, okay? Uh, and so at this point, God raises a, sends Isaiah. Isaiah is already a prophet at this time. He's already speaking uh, for God. But God sends Isaiah to go to King Ahaz in the midst of this. When he's freaking out, when he's fearing for that they're going to be conquered, he's fearing for what's going to happen, he sends Isaiah to declare to him that not to align with anyone. Don't align with the Israel. Don't align with Syria. Don't align with the Assyrians because I am faithful. I am your God. I will protect you. And so Isaiah comes with this message to tell him that, hey, this isn't going to, the, the Israel and Syria that you're afraid of, it's not going to come to pass because God is faithful and a trust in him. But he's, he's already shared that, but then we pick it up in verse 10 and this is what he says, 10 through 14, to King Ahaz. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, and this is through Isaiah. Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask and I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, hear then, O house of David. Is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And so, so this is the context. Um, you know, I kind of told you what was going on. Isaiah said, you know, God will protect you. And so, um, so Isaiah goes to Ahaz and says, hey, ask God for a sign. You know, God's faithful. He can be trusted. Ask God for a sign. Seek him. Right. And, it, and Isaiah sounds all spiritual at first, right? Let's not put God to the test. Right. But we learn in 2 Kings chapter 16 that Ahaz was not following God. So while that sounds spiritual for him to say, let's not put that to the test, that's the equivalent of after Isaiah says, hey, God's faithful. You don't need to align with anyone. Ask him for a sign of Ahaz going, la, 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 I'm not listening. La, 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 I'm just going to do whatever I want to do, right? I don't want to listen. I'm not going to ask God. I'm not going to talk to God because if I seek God or ask for a sign, then I'm going to have to do what he calls me to do, right? Uh, and so... So uh, Isaiah says, okay, well, if you're not going to ask for a sign, 
I'll go ahead and give the sign to the house of David, to all of God's people, okay? So obviously Ahaz isn't listening. So Isaiah says, okay, well, I'm gonna give you a sign anyway. Here's the sign that God will be, that, that a virgin shall have a child and that child will be named Emmanuel, which means God with us. And, and so, so that's the, the context of this. Um, now, this part, this part is a little confusing, so hang with me. Um, scholars believe that there was a dual fulfillment of this prophecy. Uh, and they, that means that they believe there was a fulfillment at the time that it was given in Ahaz's day, okay? That we read about this in chapter 8. They believe that a child was born. Now, again, not a miracle birth, not a virgin birth, but they believe that a child was born um, at that time. And it has to do with how you define the word. The word for virgin can also mean young maiden. And so that's how that's, they believe there was a dual fulfillment. But what we're going to see in the next prophecy we're going to look at in Isaiah 9, it becomes really clear that the child that Isaiah is talking about was ultimately fulfilled in Jesus in a miracle birth and the character of this child. Um, it's going to later become clear that these promises are, are talking about um, a future child to be born and which was fulfilled in Jesus. Uh, and so just, so let me, let, let me show you this, what I'm talking about. So if you come over to Isaiah 9, come down to verse 6 and 7, um, it says this. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Uh, and so, so here's the, here's the bad part of the story. After you've, after you've seen the, the prophecy that was given, the, the call to trust in God, Ahaz didn't do that. Uh, not only did he reject what Isaiah shared with him, but he decided to take matters in his own hands and he decided to align with the Assyrians, um, to protect himself, uh, against the Israel and Syria. So that actually worked at first because just as God declared, Israel and Syria did not conquer the southern kingdom uh, because they were defeated by the Assyrians. But the problem is it didn't, last for, it didn't work out for Ahaz either. That, uh, in the end, Assyria turned on uh, Ahaz and conquered Judah as well, conquered Jerusalem. Uh, and so... So because, uh, so not only that, uh, before, actually before that took place, uh, Ahaz lost his mind. Like once he realized that they were turning on him and that they were going to come, he started sacrificing any God he could come up with uh, uh, in the neighboring kingdom, just, any, just looking anywhere for help but to the one true living God. And because of that, the legacy of his life is he led Israel into idolatry and it ultimately led into their exile. And so, so this, so what does that mean for us? What does that mean for us as we think about Christmas? Um, prophecies like this, this came at a time of, uh, of fear, of darkness, of um, exile, uh, all of this. But prophecies like this continue to shed light on the ways that God would keep his promises in spite of what was going on in spite of what was happening around him, how they could live by faith and not by sight. That in the midst of that, uh, in the midst of darkness, pain, suffering, and fear, the people were reminded that despite imperfect and unfaithful kings, there was coming a perfect and faithful king in Jesus. And, and then over 700 years later, we read the fulfillment of this prophecy in Matthew chapter 1. Look at that with me real quick. Um, Matthew chapter 1, verse, starting in verse 20. And this is, uh, this is right after the angel has uh, revealed to Mary that she's going to have, uh, this, she was going to bear the Son of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and Joseph, hearing the news, is having a hard time with that, right? He's wrestling with that a little bit. He's still trying to make sense of it, trying to figure out what in the world's going on. And so now it's time for Joseph to get a visit from an angel. 
Uh, and so that's what we pick up in, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. Here's what we read. Um, but as he considered these things, Joseph wrestling with what all is going on. So as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son and you will call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, what prophet? Isaiah, that we just read. Um, and Matthew connects this for us. Here's what he says, verse 23. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And then Matthew goes ahead and defines that for us, um, which means God with us. That is the promise of Christmas, that God is with us. And, and so we see this, that... Um, uh, at this understanding for centuries, here's what's crazy. For centuries, uh, Jewish, um, Jewish religious leaders and, and scholars, they had known that prophecy, but they didn't expect it to, to have a, uh, a literal fulfillment. You know, they believed that it was predicting uh, one, uh, the coming of some great leader whose work, figuratively speaking, would be as though God was present with us, but not that literally God and was coming to earth in the form of a child. And that's the heart of Christmas. Jesus is God with us. This child is literally God in the flesh. Not just another prophet telling us how to get to God or how to find God, but God himself coming to find us. Do you understand the power of that promise? And that does not amaze us as much as it should. Because when you read about all the encounters with God in the Old Testament, um, you know, you, you read God revealing himself to Israel as, uh, as a pillar of fire, right? Um, and, and he reveals himself to Job as a, a hurricane or a tornado. Um, and when Moses asked to see the face of God, he's told, nope, it'll kill you. The best, I can, best you can do is you can see where I just was, right? You can see my back. You can see where I've been. And when Moses comes down the mountain, just from that encounter with God, his face is so radiant with the glory of God that people can't look at him. I mean, that's the glory of God. That's the, the power of God, right? And yet, the promise of Christmas, when Jesus shows up, he wasn't a pillar of fire. He wasn't an earthquake. He wasn't a tornado. He was a baby. There's nothing like a baby. Like a like a child can have their own agenda and they'll run from you, right? But a baby, a baby can be held and kissed and loved and, and they cling to you. A baby comes close, comes near. Why would God come in the form of a baby rather than a firestorm or a whirlwind? Because this time, God didn't come to pronounce judgment. He came to bear it. He came to take it upon himself. He came to once and for all break down the barrier of humanity and God. To break down the barrier of sin. And so the, the incarnation didn't happen to prove to us that God existed. It happened to bring God near to us in the form of Jesus. And do you get that all the names in Isaiah 9 are, are relational names? God with us. The, the, he's our first, our wonderful counselor. And so that's my question this morning. Do you, know, do you understand that, that Jesus is your wonderful counselor? You know what a counselor does? A, a good one anyway. <laughs> a counselor helps you, helps you see sometimes stuff you already know, right? But it helps reveal truth to you, right? And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, in the life. So who's, who's wiser than God? Anybody want to take that one on? Nobody. Right? So all the wisdom of God is in Jesus. And he's come near. He's your wonderful counselor. Do so you want guidance? You want to know what you should do? You want to know how you should handle things? You want to know how you should walk? What you should think? 
Go to the truth of God's word. Let him reveal that to you. That's Jesus, your wonderful counselor. But he's not just a wonderful counselor. He's your mighty God. And I know we don't have a lot of time, but just, just hear me out on this one because I, I just love this visual. When I think about God, about Jesus being the mighty God, I always think about the, um, the storm in Mark chapter four when the disciples are in the boat and Jesus is in the boat with them, right? And the storm comes and they're sailors, right? So they're freaking out. That means this isn't like a light rain, okay? They've dealt with storms before. They are fearing for their life. And Jesus is in the boat. They go and wake him up. And Peter's like, do you care that we're going to die? And what does Jesus do? He stands up. He yawns. And it says he rebukes the winds and the waves. You rebuke something that's underneath you. Like, like this is an example. Jesus basically turns the weather off. This is the mighty God that we're talking about. You know how like in a parking lot, an alarm goes off and somebody runs out embarrassed. Oh, that's, that's my car. I got it. I, I'll turn it off, right? Jesus stands up and says, knock it off. My bad, guys. That's my storm. <laughs> and then the answer that is, who controls the winds and the waves that even they obey him? This is the mighty God. He is with you. How would that change how you live, what you're able to do if you knew the mighty God was with you? I mean, he's your wonderful counselor. He's a mighty God, right? He's your everlasting father. And Jesus says, hey, even, even you as sinful parents know how to give good gifts to your kids. And you know, if you as sinful people know how to give good gifts to your kids, how much more? is your faithful heavenly father know what you need. You have an everlasting father. He's not just powerful, he's personal. He cares about you. He made you, he loves you. That's the heart of the gospel. And so he's a wonderful counselor, he's a mighty God, he's an everlasting father, and lastly, he's the prince of peace. And so in the midst of whatever you're walking through, maybe you're hearing all this and you're saying, that's great for Ahaz, you know, like he had this promise, but, and I understand things were bad, but that was before Jesus was born. We're on the other side of Jesus being born and the world's still messed up. Like, what does that mean? That means that we live in a now and not yet kingdom of God. Because when Jesus first came, he came to deal with our sin. Because your biggest problem isn't that you're not comfortable. Your biggest problem isn't your health. Your biggest problem isn't uh, how bad your circumstances are. Your biggest problem is that you're eternally separated from God. And so Jesus came to die for our sins in the first advent. But he's coming again. And when he returns, he will end all suffering. That's the promise of Christmas. The first advent dealt with our sin. The second advent deals with our suffering. But in the meantime, we're watching and waiting because he's working in our waiting. You know why? Because he's a wonderful counselor. He's a mighty God. He's an everlasting father and he is the prince of peace. So I want to end with this question. As the band comes, here's the question. How would it change your life if you lived and believed that God was with you? How would that change your life? No matter what's going on around you, if you lived and believed that God, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace is with you. How would it change what you're willing to do knowing that he's the mighty God, right? How would it change how you seek him and how you seek for direction and guidance knowing that he's a wonderful counselor? How would it change how you trust him knowing that he's an everlasting father, that he knows better for you than you do, right? It's like when a kid is little and you tell them they can't play in the street, they don't understand that's for their good. All I know is you ruin their life, <laughs> Right? 
But as a father, you love them and you know what's better for them, even better than what they want. They just want to play in the street, right? But you know better. They don't understand. How much more so does our Heavenly Father know what we need when we don't understand? We trust Him. How would it change if you knew that the Prince of Peace is with you? No, suffering has not ended yet. In the midst of darkness, in the midst of struggle, in the midst of one of the hardest years ever, how would it change to know the Prince of Peace is with you? He's in you. He's alive in you. That's the promise of Christmas. So I'm going to pray for us in that this morning. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you that you came. God, in the midst of our our pain, in the midst of our struggle, in the midst of our darkness, in the midst of our, our separation, God, in the midst of our fear, you came and you've come near to us. And we just declare this morning that you are our wonderful counselor. You are the mighty God. You are our everlasting father. You are the prince of peace. And so we thank you for the promise that you are with us. And we pray that that truth would transform us, God. It would change how we live and how we see and that we would truly walk by faith and not by sight because of who you are, because of what you've done, and because of the truth that you are coming again. And so we look to you, we cling to you, and we seek you. We thank you for all that you've done and all that you're going to do. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.